Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Thursday, January 18, 2024. The House and Senate pass another temporary federal government funding extension, preventing a partial government shutdown starting Friday night and giving lawmakers more time to write and pass the regular 12 spending bills now that congressional Republicans and Democrats and President Joe Biden have all agreed to top-line spending amounts. But today, a good number of Republicans in both chambers voted no on the temporary bill, objecting to the spending levels going forward and also to not being able to attach immigration and border security changes to that bill. The House Homeland Security Committee holds a second impeachment hearing for Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over his dealings with immigration and border security policies. President Biden travels to Raleigh, North Carolina, to talk about infrastructure investment, including for high-speed Internet connectivity. He also contrasts his Bidenomics agenda, on which he is running for re-election, with that of Donald Trump the current frontrunner for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination. And two Democratic presidential challengers to President Biden campaign in New Hampshire ahead of next Tuesday's primary, Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson. Attorney General Merrick Garland is in Uvalde, Texas, releasing the Justice Department's report on the law enforcement response to the elementary school mass shooting in 2022. The report identifies what it calls cascading failures that led to people dying. And the White House responds to the airstrikes from Iran and Pakistan targeting militant groups in each other's country. And we start with the House and Senate passing the extension of temporary federal government funding from the current deadlines for two different parts of the government, January 19th and February 2nd to March 1st and March 8th. The Senate went first, taking up the extension bill known as the Continuing Resolution, or CR, And there were two amendments offered, both of which failed. The first was from Senator Rand Paul, Republican of Kentucky, and it would have limited foreign aid to the Palestinian Authority or any other Palestinian governing entity in the West Bank and Gaza. The vote on that amendment was 44 to 50. The second of the amendments to the CR would replace the short-term government funding bill with a full-year funding bill. The sponsor, Senator Roger Marshall, Republican of Kansas, said on the Senate floor that it would save money. Under the bipartisan agreements made as the part of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, a full year CR through September 30th would result in a spending cut of $73 billion, bringing our total discretionary spending down to $1.56 trillion, a significant cut from the $1.66 trillion funding deal that's in the works currently. This is the fiscally responsible decision that the American people deserve and Congress has an obligation to make. We should agree to this spending cut, roll up our sleeves and get back to work on an even more responsible funding package for the next fiscal year that will start to address our nation's massive $34 trillion debt. Senator Roger Marshall, Republican from Kansas, offering his amendment on the Senate floor. Senator Patty Murray, Democrat from Washington State, Appropriations Committee Chair, spoke against the amendment. I rise in opposition to the motion to commit the CR with instructions. The Senate has before it a bipartisan, bicameral CR, which keeps the government open and gives us time to negotiate and pass full-year funding bills under the Schumer-Johnson top-line agreement. The junior senator from Kansas wants us to walk away from the bipartisan compromise on the CR, guarantee a government shutdown, and accept a devastating year-long CR rather than do our jobs as senators and write full-year bills. I spoke at length recently about how a full-year CR would lock us into last year's spending plans and policies as if nothing has changed in over a year. And it would force devastating across-the-board cuts to programs that our country and families rely on, defense and non-defense alike. It is simply not an option. We need to pass this CR, keep working 24-7 to hammer out the strongest possible funding bills. And for all those reasons, I strongly oppose the motion and urge my colleagues to vote no. Senator Patty Murray, Democrat from Washington State Appropriations Committee Chair on the Senate floor. She was followed by Senator Susan Collins, Republican of Maine, ranking member on the Appropriations Committee, also speaking against Senator Marshall's attempt to change the temporary government funding measure, the CR. And it was defeated. The vote was 13 
yeses, and 82 noes. And then it was on to final passage of the original continuing resolution, referred to as a clean CR, and the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, spoke on the floor right before the vote. We have good news for America. There will not be a shutdown on Friday because both sides have worked together. The government will stay open. Services will not be disrupted. We will avoid a needless disaster. My colleagues and I, on both sides of the aisle, worked late into the evening last night to reach this agreement, so I thank everyone for their good work. Keeping the government open wasn't a given. We stayed up negotiating amendments and timing. But thanks to both sides working together, the Senate is passing the CR with enough time for the House to take it up today and send it to the President's desk well before Friday's deadline. Avoiding a shutdown is very good news for every American, especially for our veterans, our parents, our children, our farmers, our small businesses, and so many others who would have felt the sting of a government shutdown. I thank my colleagues on both sides for their good work. It's precisely what Americans want to see. Both sides working together and governing responsibly. No chaos, no spectacle, no shutdown. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on the Senate floor and the Senate passed the temporary federal government extension bill by vote of 77 to 18, all 18 no's coming from Republicans, and then sending it over to the U.S. House, where it was brought up under special rules known as suspension of the regular rules. It's a procedure that has only 40 minutes of debate instead of the default one hour. No amendments allowed, but to pass it, you need a two-thirds vote. Again, the leaders of the Appropriations Committee spoke in favor. First, Republican Chair Kay Granger of Texas. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of this short-term continuing resolution. While we have made progress in our efforts to finish fiscal year 2024 bills, Congress has much more work to do and more time to need is needed to negotiate bills on both sides that could support. The House and Senate took very different approaches in this year's bills, and finding common ground will not be easy. But now that the Speaker has negotiated a top, top, top line, we can move forward. I want to be clear, as we begin to con- conference these bills, House Republicans are committed to fighting for meaningful policy changes. I take thank the, I thank the Speaker for his reasonable plan to keep the government open and give con- Congress more time to negotiate. I urge my colleagues to support this CR, and I reserve the balance of my time. Congresswoman Kay Granger, chair of the Appropriations Committee, Republican from Texas, also supporting the government funding extension, the ranking Democrat on the Appropriations Committee, Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut. I rise in support of this continuing resolution, which I hope is the last of the fiscal year 2024 appropriations process. This continuing resolution keeps the government open while the appropriations committees in the House and the Senate continue bipartisan negotiations on final 2024 funding bills that are in line with the agreement we have had since last June. I am encouraged by the conversations that have taken place since the top line numbers were reaffirmed in the Schumer-Johnson agreement, and I appreciate the good faith and the respectful four-corner negotiation that took place to put forward this continuing resolution. I hope the current pace and tone will result in swiftly finalizing all 2024 funding bills in a bipartisan fashion. I might add, I think the Senate just voted a short time ago, which was, I think, 77 to uh, uh, 18, overwhelmingly, to move forward with the appropriations bills. House Republicans wasted the entire duration of the first continuing resolution and most of the second, arguing over 2024 funding levels they agreed to last summer. However, I believe we have finally moved on from that charade, and there is now a mutual understanding that the only way to finally end the saga of 2024 funding is to write appropriations bills that can earn the support of both Democrats 
and Republicans in the House and in the Senate. Bills that will likely need to pass under suspension of the rules, like the bill we are considering today. While there may be a Republican majority on paper, more than 200 Democrats will be needed to keep the government's lights on and ensure that the American people have uninterrupted access to the services and programs that help their families stay healthy, boost our economy, and keep us safe and secure. Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, Democrat from Connecticut, Appropriations Committee ranking member on the House floor. Claiming the debate time in opposition to this temporary federal government extension, Congressman Chip Roy, Republican of Texas, a member of the Freedom Caucus. It is Groundhog Day in the House chamber all the time, every day. Yet again, spending money we don't have. Last year, an agreement was reached with spending levels and caps Now, I didn't particularly love those levels of caps. A number of us didn't. And there were supposedly some side deals. Does that sound swampy? Side deals. But what was written into the law? What was written into the law was a level that was somewhere around a 1% reduction over last year's enormously bloated omnibus spending level. A 1% cut. So can this body possibly adhere to those caps? No, no, we can't do that. Last year, we tried to fix this place. We tried to do appropriations bills. We passed 10 appropriations bills out of the committee, seven appropriations bills off the floor. We tried to restore regular order. We had about 1,100 amendments. We tried to process those so the American people could see their chamber working again. But what happened? Everything reverts back to the mean in this town. The same old story. Because a side deal is cut. We have to spend at a higher level, you see. And that's what's going on back and forth between the Senate and the House. So for the American people, they need to understand what's happening. This continuing resolution will fund your government at the same level as last year's massive omnibus spending bill that all my Republican colleagues, all of them with the exception of two in this chamber, were adamantly opposed to, voted against, spoke out against, put press releases out against, campaigned against, and they're gonna vote for it right now. They're gonna vote to continue to spend at that level. Not only that, they're gonna vote to continue to fund the radical progressive policies embedded in it. Continue to fund the bureaucracy that's a war of the American people. Continue to fund open borders. Continue to fund Alejandro Mayorkas. Even as we attempt to impeach him in the Homeland Security Committee, we're going to fund him. We're going to fund those open borders. We're going to fund the United Nations. We're going to fund the World Health Organization. We're going to fund UNRWA to give money to the Palestinians that gets to Hamas. And we're going to go campaign against those things, but we're going to fund them. Congressman Chip Roy, Republican from Texas, on the House floor. The House passed this CR, continuing resolution to keep the government from shutting down by a vote of 314 to 108. On the Republican side, the yeses were 107 and the noes were 106. On the Democratic side, the yeses were 207 and the noes were 2. And that 314 in the yes column, more than the two-thirds vote needed under the rules that they were using. Washington Post reporter Mariana Sotomayor reporting that Congressman Bob Good, Republican from Virginia, chair of the Freedom Caucus, met with Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana, before this vote to urge him to allow an amendment to deal with border security be added to the bill. And it was not. The the bill came up as is. Mariana Sotomayor with a quote from Congressman Good. If you don't need our vote for the material bills that matter for the country, such as funding the government and our major spending packages, and you continue to pass those under suspension of the rules with predominantly Democratic votes, then don't presume you're going to have our votes for the messaging bills that don't matter, that make us feel better, but are dead in arrival in the Senate. On Wall Street today, the Dow up 201, Nasdaq up 200 points, S&P up 41. President Joe Biden traveled to Raleigh, North Carolina today to announce $82 million to connect 16,000 homes and businesses in the state to high-speed Internet. The money coming from the 
2021 COVID-19 relief bill. White House fact sheet says the investment will also create jobs in manufacturing and construction to produce, quote, made in America fiber optic cable that will build out our Internet infrastructure across the country. North Carolina is also one of the battleground states in the 2024 presidential election. And President Biden, currently the favorite to be renominated as the Democratic candidate, took aim at the current frontrunner for the Republican Party nomination, former President Donald Trump. Our approach is a fundamental break from trickle-down economics, supercharged by my predecessor. My predecessor, everything was trickled down, but not a lot trickled. <laughs> and I'm serious. Which tax cuts for the wealthy and big corporations, shipping goods overseas. How many people do you know in this state and other states? There was a factory in town that employed 300, 400 people. And all of a sudden, you found that factory shipped overseas. Why was it shipped overseas? Cheaper labor costs. So we were shipping factories overseas and importing the product they made here. Well, guess what? We're doing the opposite. We're making it here and shipping the product overseas. I'm serious. And also that trickle down shrank public investment in education, infrastructure in education, have hollowed out communities, closing factories, leaving too many behind. And now my predecessors like to say, America is a failing nation. In my face, bless me, Father, for his sin. I mean, come on. <laughs> a failing nation. And by the way, did you hear he wants to see the stock market crash? Because he does not want it now. We're doing well. He acknowledges by that we're doing pretty damn well economically and getting better. He wants to see the stock market crash. You know why? He doesn't want to be the next Herbert Hoover. As I told him, he's already Hoover. <laughs> he's the only president to be president for four years and lose jobs, not gain any jobs. Come on, man. You know, some of the things he said, well, I don't get started. <laughs> but look, frankly, to put it very politely, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Meanwhile, the vast majority of Republicans in Congress voted against our infrastructure law. We got enough to make it work of 30 some, but the vast majority voted against it. They all voted against all the other bills that I had. I mean, 100 percent voted against. And guess what? Whether it's Marjorie Taylor Greene or whoever, they're out when these new projects come, they're, 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 they're welcoming them to their state. They vote against it all. So I told them I'll be there for the groundbreaking with them. President Biden at the Abbott's Creek Community Center in Raleigh, North Carolina today. Some news about the president's son, Hunter, a joint statement from Congressman James Comer, Republican from Kentucky and chair of the Oversight Committee, and Congressman Jim Jordan, Republican from Ohio, and chair of the Judiciary Committee, reads that Hunter Biden will appear before our committees for a deposition on February 28, 2024. His deposition will come after several interviews with Biden family members and associates. We look forward to Hunter Biden's testimony. This is part of the impeachment inquiry by the Oversight Committee, joined by the Judiciary Committee and the Ways and Means Committee in the House. Two challengers to President Biden for the Democratic nomination for president this year, Congressman Dean Phillips of Minnesota and author Marianne Williamson campaigned today in New Hampshire. New Hampshire will be holding its presidential primary on Tuesday, January 23rd. And although President Biden will not be on the ballot, he is following the Democratic National Committee's schedule of putting South Carolina's primary first. There are some efforts in New Hampshire to encourage a write-in campaign. Congressman Phillips was in Manchester, New Hampshire, joined by former 2020 Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Yang. Congressman Phillips talking about the power of artificial intelligence. Men in their 80s, frankly, even good men, good women, are not in a position to anticipate and prepare us for the future. We had 100 years to prepare for climate change. We knew 100 years ago what would happen by burning fossil fuels. And what did we do? Nothing. AI, my friends, we don't have 100 years. We have months, if not just a couple years at the most. I anticipate it, I'm prepared for it, and I will be our first AI president. But how do we start? We start by doing what you do in America, bringing together the best and brightest from all around the country, industry leaders, community leaders, those who will be affected by AI. I hope you all know this. It will be the most transformational technology in human history. 
It is going to save us all cost. It is going to make the federal government, if someone's willing to actually invest in it, much more effective and efficient. It is going to generate health outcomes that will transcend anything we could dream about right now, create new medicines, generate new ideas. It's going to be beautiful, but it also has great risks. It's going to disenfranchise this economy. It's going to be disruptive in ways that we can actually anticipate. But if we do nothing now, which is what is happening right now in Washington, nothing. I will be our first AI president. I'm going to put together a task force of the best and brightest to anticipate what's coming and make recommendations, as we do here, to employ best practices, to put guardrails on the nefarious use of AI. But most importantly, let's talk about the blessings of AI. And when we are fearful of new things, what do we do first? We overregulate because we don't even think about what's possible. And let me tell you, I come from a Congress in which I'm a, I'm a youthful guy, if you can imagine that. We don't have people right now. We have very few people who even understand it. And if you do not understand it, all you want to do is regulate it. I want to be the leader of AI. I want to employ it in our federal government. How about that? To save costs, develop better outcomes. How many of you are waiting for checks from the IRS for too long? Yeah. How many of you can't get any customer service phone answered at any of the federal agencies, right? Yeah. Right. That's how we're going to change things. We can do better, and I promise you I will. Democratic presidential candidate Dean Phillips, a Minnesota congressman in Manchester, New Hampshire today. He mentioned his age. He turns 55 years old in two days. Another Democrat running for president, Marianne Williamson, spoke to voters today in Keene, New Hampshire. There is a matrix of corporate power in this country. And the institutional greed that is represented by this matrix of corporate power exercises economic tyranny on the people of the United States. The only reason we don't have universal health care is because of the institutionalized greed of the insurance companies. The only reason we have a million point three people rationing their insulin, 75 million Americans who are underinsured or uninsured, over a, a million rationing their insulin, plus people putting GoFundMe pages on the internet for life-saving operations for their loved ones is because of the institutionalized greed of insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. We have carcinogens in our food that are not allowed in the food in Canada or in the food of any other advanced democracy because of the institutionalized greed of big food. We have chemicals in our pesticides that harm a developing child's brain because of the institutionalized greed of chemical companies. We have desecration of our farming sector because of the institutionalized greed of big agricultural companies. We have little children, not just parents praying when they drop off their kids, but little kids praying before they go to school. Dear God, don't let me get shot in algebra today because of the institutionalized greed of gun manufacturers. We are ramping up rather than ramping down fossil fuel extraction at the very time when we most need to be ramping it down because of the institutionalized greed of the big oil companies. And we have in our lifetimes fought wars, which in retrospect, everyone on both left and right now agree were little more than piggy bank activity on the part of the defense contracting industry. At what point are we the people going to say enough? At what point? Because right now, that matrix of corporate power and their lobbyists in Washington have turned Washington into a system of legalized bribery. And that system will not disrupt itself. That's our job. Democratic presidential candidate Marianne Williamson today in Keene, New Hampshire. Again, on the Democratic side, President Joe Biden running for re-election is not on the ballot in New Hampshire because the Democratic National Committee wants South Carolina to be the first primary, and the president is following that. But on the Republican side, there are a number of candidates still running. And starting Saturday, January 20th, through primary night, which is January, uh, Tuesday, January 23rd, you can hear candidates make their final pitches in New Hampshire on C-SPAN. We'll also feature campaign analysis with political reporters and your calls and social media reaction. And then primary night, we begin at 8 p.m. Eastern with coverage of the candidate's speeches, results, and, of course, your calls and reaction on social media. That's on C-SPAN television, radio.org, and on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app. This is Washington Today. Story from the Associated Press, police officials who responded to the deadly Uvalde 
Texas elementary school shooting waited far too long to confront the gunman, acted with no urgency in establishing a command post, and communicated inaccurate information to grieving families, according to a Justice Department report released Thursday that identifies cascading failures in law enforcement's handling of the massacre. The Justice Department report, the most comprehensive federal accounting of the malign police response to the May 24, 2022 shooting at Robb Elementary School, catalogs a sweeping array of training, communication, leadership, and technology problems that federal officials say contributed to the crisis lasting far longer than necessary. That was from Associated Press. Attorney General Merrick Garland was in Uvalde today holding a news conference. Last night, I met with some of the survivors and the loved ones of the victims of the horrific mass shooting at Robb Elementary School. I came here to tell them that the United States Department of Justice has finished its critical incident review. In undertaking this review at the request of the then mayor, the Justice Department committed to using our expertise and independence to assess the law enforcement response to the shooting and to provide guidance moving forward. As I told families and survivors last night, the department's review concluded that a series of major failures, failures in leadership, in tactics, in communications, in training, and in preparedness, were made by law enforcement lawyers and others responding to the mass shooting at Robb Elementary. As a result, 33 students and three of their teachers, many of whom have been shot, were trapped in a room with an active shooter for over an hour as law enforcement officials remained outside. I also told the families and survivors how deeply sorry I am for the losses they suffered that day and for the losses they have suffered every day since. I told them that the priority for the Justice Department in preparing this report has been to honor the memories of those who were taken from them. And I told the families gathered last night what I hope is clear among the hundreds of pages and thousands of details in this report. Their loved ones deserve better. The law enforcement response at Robb Elementary School on May 24, 2022, and in the hours and days after, was a failure that should not have happened. We hope to honor the victims and the survivors by working together to try to prevent anything like this from ever happening again, here or anywhere. Attorney General Merrick Garland in Uvalde, Texas. He also said had law enforcement agencies followed generally accepted practices in active shooter situations and gone right after the shooter and stopped him, lives would have been saved, people would have survived. Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta at the news conference, described some of the mistakes, including, she said, victims who had passed away were taken to the hospital in ambulances while children with bullet wounds were put on buses. President Biden putting out a statement that reads in part, Congress must now pass common sense gun safety laws to ensure that mass shootings like this one don't happen in the first place. We need universal background checks. We need a national red flag law, and we must ban assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. The families of Vivaldi and all American communities deserve nothing less. Beto O'Rourke, former Democratic congressman of Texas, former nominee for the U.S. Senate and for the governorship, and ran for president in 2020, putting out a statement, the DOJ Uvalde report gets one thing right. The response by law enforcement who waited over an hour to act was a failure, but it doesn't go far enough, he writes. Without recommending criminal charges, there will be no accountability. Without accountability, there will be no change. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi, this is Rachel from C-SPAN's podcast team. I'd like to introduce you to one of the producers here at C-SPAN, my colleague, Sean. Thanks, Rachel. If you're a fan of Washington Today, we think you'll also like our evening newsletter, Word for Word, which brings you a recap of the day's most important political and policy events delivered right to your inbox. Read about what happened on Capitol Hill and at the White House and watch video highlights featuring the day's newsmakers. Hear them word for word. Join our community of informed listeners and viewers. Head over to cspan.org slash connect and subscribe to Word for Word today. Thanks for listening and staying connected with Word for Word. Subscribe now at cspan.org slash connect. Thank you. 
Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. An article at The Hill, an internal Republican memo shows the House Homeland Security Committee decided last week it would mark up an impeachment resolution for Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas at the end of the month. The memo obtained by The Hill came the same day the committee kicked off its series of impeachment hearings. And amid complaints from Democrats, the proceedings have been rushed to back a predetermined conclusion. The plans outlined in the memo, which Republicans shared inadvertently, track with a pledge by the chair, Mark Green, Republican of Tennessee, to swiftly consider a resolution to boot Mayorkas from his job. But asked about its contents, Green said he was not putting any timelines out and that he would not corroborate a memo. His colleague on the panel, however, backed the timeline of the memo. Congressman Michael McCall, Republican of Texas, told reporters he expected the articles of impeachment to drop January 31st. That was reporting from The Hill. The House Homeland Security Committee held its second hearing today on the possible impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas. Republicans have been focusing on the secretary's handling of immigration and border security. Congressman McCall questioned witness Josephine Dunn, whose daughter died from fentanyl poisoning. The Supreme Court recently held that impeachment is a tool Congress can use to hold this secretary accountable. It's the legal justification. I believe he's violated his oath. He's violated the public trust. He's violated your daughters. I intend to personally uphold my oath to my country that I took in office. It's been a dereliction of duty of the grossest proportions I've seen in my 25 years of dealing with this border. Ms. Dunn, I I couldn't agree. Fentanyl is a weapon of mass destruction. I passed a bill out of my committee defining it as such. It comes from China and they make it in Mexico and they kill our children here 200,000, more than Vietnam, World War II. My children have been to six funerals now. I've seen it personally, the destruction it does every five minutes. It is a fentanyl super highway. And this border policy is personally responsible for it. He took an oath to defend and protect the Constitution and the American people, air, land, and sea from enemies, foreign and domestic. Ms. Dunn, do you believe he violated that oath? Yes, sir. I flew from Arizona to meet him and face him and ask him why. And he's not here today. I did not know that until after I landed yesterday. And he doesn't have the decency no. to even show up. That is correct. And talk to you personally. Today is my daughter's birthday. I would have much rather been home with my poor husband grieving her. I didn't need to be here today. So whatever he's doing, I hope it's more important than that. Let me say I'm sorry. Thank you. Because apparently the secretary doesn't care to show up and say that to you. No. Do you know he's meeting with Mexican officials today? Exactly. How does that make you feel? Oh, you have no idea how I feel. I'll be meeting with Mexican officials later next week. And I'm going to have a different story for them. I'm going to have your story that I will take to them. Congressman Michael McCall, Republican from Texas, and witness Josephine Dunn at the Homeland Security Committee hearing. Other witnesses invited by the majority Republicans were a parent whose 20-year-old daughter was allegedly murdered in Maryland by an unaccompanied 17-year-old listed as an MS-13 gang member in El Salvador, and also a county sheriff from Arizona. About Secretary Mayorkas not testifying, again from the article at thehill.com, Committee Chair Mark Green had asked Secretary Mayorkas two weeks in advance to appear at Thursday's hearing, but the secretary had a scheduling conflict while hosting a delegation from Mexico to discuss border issues, asking to instead find another date. The minority Democrats invited witness was Deborah Perlstein, Princeton University law professor, and the committee's ranking Democrat, Benny Thompson of Mississippi, asked her about the constitutionality of impeaching the secretary. Professor Perlstein, last week, you joined two dozen of the country's most knowledgeable constitutional lawyers on a bipartisan letter to Speaker Johnson and Chairman Green explaining that the Republican case against Secretary Mayorkas is 
unjustified as a matter of constitutional law. Can you explain in simple terms why you and your colleagues concluded that impeaching the secretary is unjustified under the Constitution? Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Yes. Um, the term high crimes and misdemeanors, which is what's at issue here, is a limited term of art. It includes only those offenses against the system of government, not ordinary crimes, offenses against the structure of government comparable to treason and bribery, offenses that interfere in the way the government works. The allegations that have been set forth here, uh, which are very serious, are profound complaints about the policies that the current secretary has pursued. They're policies that the secretary has pursued under the pr current president of the United States who appointed the secretary and was elected to pursue those policies. Policy differences, and I agree with my colleague at the last hearing, no matter how profound, are exactly not what impeachment was meant to be for. The framers were very worried that impeachment would become something like a tool of the parliamentary system so that Congress could, in essence, hold the president and the president's administration on a leash. The framers wanted each branch to remain independent to make their own policy judgments so that their ambition could counteract ambition and they would fight each other on democratic terms over what the right answer was. Deborah Perlstein, Princeton University law professor, testifying before the House Homeland Security Committee and questioned by the ranking Democrat, Benny Thompson of Mississippi. The hearing ran about four hours. We have the video at cspan.org. The Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas spoke today at the U.S. Conference of Mayors Winter Meeting in Washington, D.C. about the work of the department, including immigration and its partnering with cities. If I talked about a small group of wealthy Georgia landowners who conspired to kidnap hundreds of people and force them to dig onions with their bare hands for 12 or 15 hours a day without pay, if I said that these victims were housed in unsanitary conditions, beaten, raped, murdered, and prevented from fleeing at gunpoint, all while the perpetrators made millions off their inhumane scheme, you could be forgiven for assuming I was speaking of slavery in the pre-Civil War South. I am not. Such horrific, monstrous situations are still found in the darkest shadows of our country. What I just described was a human and labor trafficking operation that we dismantled only two years ago in a collaborative law enforcement effort dubbed Operation Blue Onion. When I say we, I mean the Department of Homeland Security's human trafficking experts, researchers, investigators, and caseworkers, agents from Homeland Security Investigations, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, and U.S. Customs and Border Protection, working alongside and closely with five county sheriff's office in the region, plus other state and federal partners. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas at the U.S. Conference of Mayors Winter Meeting in Washington, D.C., part of a speech that covered many aspects of the department's activities. Others were responding to extreme weather, violent crime, domestic violent extremism, and cyber attacks. Story from the Washington Post, President Joe Biden is pushing for a deal on border security and Ukraine funding, but a major sticking point in congressional negotiations has become whether to preserve the president's authority to allow migrants into the U.S. for special cases during emergencies or global unrest. Republicans deride the authority, known as humanitarian parole, as the, as the Biden administration end run around Congress that allows into the U.S. large numbers of migrants who further tax an already overextended immigration system. That story from The Washington Post. President Biden answered some questions about immigration and border security following his meeting Wednesday at the White House with the bipartisan congressional leadership about his national security supplemental spending request, that is the aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, and Republicans requiring the U.S. border security be part of that. The president spoke today as he left the White House. The questions about U.S. border and Ukraine are interspersed with questions about the Middle East, including this week's airstrikes between Iran and Pakistan, 
and the latest U.S. airstrikes on Houthi militants in Yemen aimed at degrading their ability to continue attacking shipping in the Red Sea and surrounding area. What do you make of these attacks between Iran and Pakistan? As you can see, Iran is not particularly well liked in the region. Yeah. And uh, where, where that goes, we're working on now. I don't know where that goes. How, 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 was, your, how was your meeting yesterday? I thought the meeting went well yesterday. I thought the meeting went well. Where are these sticking points on the border agreement? agreement? Where are the disagreements to work I don't think we have any sticking points, though. Are the airstrikes in Yemen working? Well, when you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. Mr. President, how do you feel about aid for Ukraine after yesterday's meeting with members of Congress? I think the vast majority of members of Congress support aid for Ukraine. The question is whether or not a small minority are going to hold it up, which could be a disaster. President Biden leaving the White House today. The noise in the background is the engine from the presidential helicopter. On those dueling airstrikes between Iran and Pakistan, Associated Press writes that the countries share a 900-kilometer, 560-mile, largely lawless border where smugglers and militants roam freely. Both countries have suspected each other of supporting or at least behaving leniently towards some of the groups operating on the other side of the border. And the Sunni separatist group that Iran targeted on Tuesday is believed to operate out of Pakistan. They launched attacks on Iranian security forces and the group formed in 2000 launching attacks against Pakistani security forces and Chinese infrastructure projects is suspected of hiding out in Iran. John Kirby, White House National Security Council spokesperson, answered some reporters' questions as they flew on Air Force One. What are the U.S. concerns about the situation between Pakistan and Iran, and why would you see possible risks of escalation? Well, I mean, uh, these are two well-armed nations, uh, and uh, again, we, we don't we don't want to see an escalation of uh, of any armed conflict be, uh, in the region, uh, certainly between those two countries. Um, again, I want to let Pakistan speak uh, to their military operations. I want to be careful about that. As you know, they were struck first. Uh, uh, by, by Iran, uh, which uh, was obviously a, 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 another reckless attack, another example of Iran's destabilizing behavior um, in, in the region. Uh, so again, I, I think I'll leave it at that. Did the United States, was the United States aware of those attacks before they happened? Did the Pakistanis give? I am not aware of any pre-notification that we received at all. Does the United States intend to support Pakistan, seeing that it's a major non-NATO ally of the country? I don't have an update for you on that. Okay. What, what about uh, just arms control? I mean, this is, the president said that it, this shows that Iran is not well-liked. I mean, isn't that why they want a nuclear weapon? Uh, who, Iran? Yes. Uh, I'll let the Iranians and the regime speak to their um, to their ambitions. And we still maintain on our policies uh, that, uh, that we, we do not want to see uh, an Iran with nuclear weapons because an Iran with nuclear weapons is, is bad for the whole region. Uh, if not globally. Um, now, as the president said when he first came into office, we certainly would have preferred to achieve that outcome through diplomacy. Obviously, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so we will make sure that we have the capabilities and the options available to the commander-in-chief to prevent that outcome uh, uh, if it comes to that. He has said clearly we will not allow them to achieve a nuclear weapon capability. John Kirby, Strategic Communications Coordinator for the White House National Security Council with reporters on Air Force One. More on the Middle East, a Washington Post article reads, Normalizing ties between Israel and Saudi Arabia would be a key element of ending the war with Hamas and a game changer for the entire Middle East, Israeli President Isaac Herzog said Thursday at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in the Swiss town of Davos. It comes days after Saudi Arabia's foreign minister, Prince Faisal bin Farhan, said on a Davos panel, that the kingdom agreed regional peace includes peace for Israel. He said Saudi Arabia certainly would recognize Israel as part of a larger political agreement, but he said that can only happen through peace for the Palestinians through a Palestinian state. The article goes on that U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also reiterated in a talk at Davos that a pathway to statehood for Palestinians could help improve Israel's security and its relations with other countries in the region. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his right-wing government, however, are opposed to the concept of a two-state resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That reporting from Washington Post. Here's part of Israeli President Isaac Herzog's remarks. If we look at the on a bird's eye view of the of the war that we are seeing, it's it's not only between Israel and Hamas. I will deal with Israel and Hamas. But the issue is, and the world has to face it point blank, with no ifs and buts. There is an empire of evil emanating from Tehran, spending billions of dollars in arms and money and people's well-being to derail the entire stability of the world and the region. They've attacked the United States forces two nights ago, openly. They have proxies all over the region, quietly lurking to undermine any peace process and any stability of the world. And that is exactly what we are seeing, and they have to be faced by a very strong coalition. Hamas is one major element of this jihadist ISIS-type culture who has decided to launch a war against the well-being of the only nation-state of the Jewish people, butchering and murdering Jews and Muslims alike in the most a barbaric way, and we have to uproot them and enable a better future for the Palestinians who are our neighbors. We don't shy away from the fact that the Palestinians are our neighbors. But if you ask an average Israeli now about his mental or her mental state, nobody in his right mind is willing now to think about what will be the, the solution of the peace agreements, because everybody wants to know Can we be promised real safety in the future? Every Israeli wants to know that he will not be attacked in the same way from north or south or east. You have Hezbollah in the north, armed up to its neck by Iran, financed by Iran, and simply firing ongoing and killing civilians and killing soldiers and going to war with Israel. And then the world tends to forget, and time goes on, but the truth is that we are fighting a war for the entire universe, for the free world. I always say, if Israel was not there, Europe will be next, because these barbaric jihadists want to get all of us out of the region and want to get all of Europe out of its place as well. And the United States is next too. So this war is something of an essential element in the history of humankind. President of Israel Isaac Herzog at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. NBC News reports that a new deal to secure the release of hostages held by Hamas may be taking shape, although officials caution that no agreement appears imminent, according to U.S., Israeli, and Arab officials. And from Fox News, former First Lady Melania Trump remembered her mother, Amalia Nobbs, for her passion for fashion and family, celebrating the Slovenia natives' immigration to the U.S. to be with her grandson during a heartfelt eulogy at her funeral Thursday morning. That service was held at Episcopal Church of Bethesda-by-the-Sea in Palm Beach, Florida. She loved the familiarity of her homeland to be with her newborn grandson in the United States. He was my mother's compass and focus. With each step she took, she embraced the privilege bestowed upon her and in time, the privilege of becoming a U.S. citizen. She vowed to contribute, to make a difference in the world filled with uncertainty. She executed an exquisite sense of pride as my husband became the President of the United States and as I embarked on a grand odyssey traveling the corners of the globe as the First Lady. My father, my sister, Baron, Donald, and I will forever remember the echoes of our laughter that we share with our beloved Bobby over fun dinners and travels. Her conversations flowed effortlessly, adorned with grace and charm. No topic was off limits. In her presence, the world seemed to shimmer with radiant joy. She was not just a friend, but a confidant a ray of light in the darkest of days. Former First Lady Melania Trump at the funeral service for her mother, 
at a church in Palm Beach, Florida. It was attended by many members of the Trump family, including former President Donald Trump. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. To get the stories making the headlines in Washington, email to you every day. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word. You can sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.